Okay, and welcome um, to the Global NPO Coalition's webinar on the ABCs of FATF for nonprofit organizations. This is Kay Ganan, I'm co-chair of the Global Coalition, and we are very pleased that you all have joined us today, uh, December 15, 2016, uh, to hear this basic information about how FATF can impact nonprofit organizations, but also how you may be able to use it um, for your protection of civil society purposes, basically. We will have six of our members making uh, short presentations to give us basics, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we can share it with others uh, who are in different time zones or unable to join us, so please keep that in mind. Thank you, and now we will move to uh, my co-chair of the Global Coalition, Leah von Breckhoven, who is director of the Human Security Collective. Leah, um, what is FATF, basically? OK, Leah, we can't hear you. OK. All right, you there? OK. Leah, can you tell us about FATF and why it's important? Leah, please unmute your mic. You are okay, unmuted, this is. Uh, can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, we can. Okay. okay, thank you for being on this webinar. Um, what is the FATF and why is it so important? The, glo the FATF is the global standard setter for anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism standards. And the FATF assumes that if countries effectively implement these standards, financial systems and the broader economy are protected from the threats of money laundering and the financing of terrorism, thereby strengthening financial sector integrity and contributing to safety and security. 198 countries, so that's almost the entire world, have committed to implementing these standards. Who is the FATF? It is an intergovernmental body established in 1989 by the G7. Um, and uh, the standards to counter terrorism financing were included after 9-11. It is a task force and it's not a formal organization, so it's not an organization underpinned by a treaty. Currently, it has 37 members and nine regional bodies represented by ministries of finance, primarily. It works in close collaboration with the United Nations, the IMF, and the World Bank. A secretariat facilitates the work of the FATF and its regional bodies, and the secretariat is located in Paris at the OECD office, but it's not part of the OECD. The FATF is, is chaired by presidents, which is chosen uh, by the members from its membership. The president is chair of the task force for one year and presides or is chair of the plenaries three times a year the FATF organizes to discuss compliance with standards, with the standards based on evaluation reports. And one of my colleagues will later go into the evaluations, what are they, what does it mean, and what does it mean for nonprofits? Decision making by FATF occurs through consensus. Um, what does the FATF do? It researches ways criminals launder money and terrorist organizations raise and access funds. It sets global standards to make it more difficult for criminals and terrorists to do this. And it assesses how effective countries are at implementing the standards and mitigating risks. And they do that through rigorous peer evaluations. So more about those evaluations later on in this webinar. OK. OK, yeah, Leah, yeah? please tell us why nonprofits need to take the time and trouble to learn about FATF and maybe participate in some of its processes. I think it's very important for nonprofits for civil society to know about the FATF and to engage with the FATF. And why is that? It's because in particular one standard, which is recommendation eight 
of their 40 standards on money laundering and terrorism financing, how to prevent those. That standard recommendation 8 is entirely dedicated to non-profits. It singles out civil society non-profits for being vulnerable for terrorism financing abuse. And it says that non-profits need to be protected by government laws and regulations. Governments worldwide have intentionally and unintentionally implemented the standards in ways which led to pushback of civil society operational space. And also banks being required to shore up government agendas in tackling money laundering and countering terrorism financing are de-risking non-profits, meaning to say that they refuse non-profits bank accounts, they end bank accounts of non-profits, or they have to do extended due diligence for non-profits whereby cash transfers are delayed, which is quite uh, disastrous for large numbers of non-profits involved in essential work in conflict zones like providing humanitarian aid or reporting human rights violations. The way Recommendation 8 has thus been interpreted and implemented by governments and banks is an important driver of the constraining of civic space and financial inclusion worldwide. Now why is MPO engagement with the FATF important and why is it possible? Uh, the Global MPO Coalition has had constructive and critical engagement with the FATF since 2013 and the results of that will be uh, shared with you when my colleagues will tell about risk assessments, evaluation and the change in recommendation 8. Um, we have had consultations with the FATF in the process of, those ref of the revision of recommendation 8 and we are currently having engagement with the FATF on the quality of the country evaluations. But there remain a number of challenges and I think one of the most important one is that, the civil, that civil society still has no permanent representation at the FATF private consultative group meetings, which is a, meetings, which is a meeting they're organizing every year with all representatives of sectors that are affected by the FATF standards. So banks are there, uh, casino representatives are there, notaries are there. MPOs are still not represented and that is, let's say, something we are now pushing for as a global coalition. Then I think another important issue is that the engagement with the FATF is very important when it comes to having connections, having engagement with regional FATF bodies. And a number of those bodies actively seek the opportunity to engage with MPOs. And engaging with those regional bodies may be a way forward for reclaiming civic space. So I think these are the, the items which we find so important as an MPO coalition uh, to share with those to today on the webinar and which will, be, which will be going into with more detail in the coming, pres coming uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, and now we have Lara Kowinski from the Council on Foundations. So I apologize that I couldn't hear all of what Kay said, but I hope you all can hear me now. And I'm going to go into a little bit of the rationale um, for um, recommendation eight and then the changes that we've seen this year. So first, um, the rationale for change of recommendation eight of FATF is that the MPO sector and the threat environment has changed. So uh, when Recommendation 8 first came out, uh, there was a real question of how terrorist financing was happening and whether it was happening through um, NPOs and to what extent. extent. Um, the default thought process at that time was that many things are are particularly vulnerable to um, finan uh, terrorist financing. And this information was reflected, um, but 
then with some data, there was information reflected um, that perhaps nonprofits are not particularly vulnerable and they are not um, a major approach to um, terrorist misuse of them um, for their own purposes. So the old recommendation aid that we had before the summer of 2016 said that countries should review the adequacy of laws and regulations that relate to entities that can be abused for the financing of terrorism. It goes on to say nonprofit organizations are particularly vulnerable and countries should ensure that they cannot be misused. So this idea that nonprofit organizations are particularly vulnerable gave banks and governments the ability to use this language um, to do more to say that the NPO sector could be highly regulated um, under the guise of this recommendation aid. The field did an excellent job, uh, and, and, and mostly because of the coalition on this call and uh, Leah and Kay's leadership and others, to say there is data, there is information, we can t share stories to you about how this information that we are particularly vulnerable, one, is not completely accurate, and two, is having a real effect on our ability to do work. Um, and with all of those discussions, um, debates, sometimes civil, sometimes somewhat less civil, <laughs> uh, we do see a new recommendation eight for NPOs this year. And it takes out the words particularly vulnerable. And this is a huge win for the NPO sector worldwide because it gives us a way to go back to our individual governments and say, you know, there was too strong of restrictions on us um, and they don't need to continue. So the new recommendation eight says, Countries should review the adequacy of laws and regulations that relate to nonprofit organizations, which the country has identified as being vulnerable to terrorist financing abuse. So this is saying we will only look at those that we think might be vulnerable. They can be identified. So it's not a blanket. The sector is particularly vulnerable. It goes on to say countries should apply focused and proportionate measures in line with the risk-based approach to such nonprofit organizations to protect them from terrorist financing abuse. So this idea of proportionate measures and taking a risk-based approach, that's not strict liability. That's, that's the idea that the NPO sector may function and demonstrate that it's functioning within a risky area of work is not risky in and of itself, just per se, because it is MPOs. Um, so any questions or, Kay, is there further information to share? Um, there, I just have one quick question. Um, the risk-based approach, which is mentioned in the new Recommendation 8, um, yes. could you go through um, just very quickly what that means in terms of targeting and focusing uh, any any terrorist financing restrictions on MPOs. Happy to. So it is it's it's exciting to talk with all of you about the risk based approach and to share knowledge because we now have the opportunity to really speak to our individual governments and thought of collectively on what risk-based should mean. So this is what we see it meaning, and there's four big points. First, countries should identify which organizations fall within the FATF definition of NPO. So there was a lot of discussion of if you're looking for NPOs that are not legitimate, then you must know which NPOs are legitimate. So countries need to have clarity around this specific definition. Second, we need to identify which of the NPOs within that definition are vulnerable to terrorism financing abuse. So if we're looking at it in Venn diagrams, right, 
or in a filter, we have the whole NPO sector in your country, and then we have a subset, a smaller group, that may be viewed as vulnerable to terrorist financing. Third, countries should review adequate measures and laws and regulations that relate to this. So we, working with our governments, need to help them see where the risk-based approach is and is not being implemented um, so that we can get aligned with the FATF's new recommendation eight. And finally, measures must be focused and proportionate when they align to the risk-based approach. And this is really critical. And while it seems um, that the language can be interpreted many ways, the idea of proportionality with the risk-based approach is really getting to the point of overburdensome regulation on the NPO sector needs to be rolled back. And this is very exciting, I think, as we all move forward in our work. Thank you, Lara. Thank you. Next, we have Haroon Atala from Transparency International, who will tell us about the second component of the FATF standard which is the interpretive note. So, uh, Haroon, can you... Hi, Kay. Hi, everybody. Um, I mean, I'll just follow on from what Laura was talking about. The change in the wording of the, uh, of the FATF Recommendation 8 is followed by what's called an interpretive note that explains what that means. So, I'll try and take you through the interpretive note and highlight uh, some of the areas we need to watch out for and how it's implemented. The interpretive note explains how governments are going to implement this recommendation, and it's divided into four sections, um, A, B, C, and D, introduction, objectives, and general principles, measures, resources, and supervision monitoring, and investigation. And if I take you through them very quickly, because you could probably read it yourselves, but I will just try and highlight the main points in each of them. Um, it's that the recommendation itself in the introduction has three sections. The first issue that we need to be aware of is this issue of saying how do we define what's a non-profit organization. And they took a very functional definition, it's very broad, so it highlights all the good works that you would imagine to see, charitable, religious, cultural, educational, social, and so on. The second part of it goes into the recognition of the important role played by the MPOs, and this is something again mentioned in the interpretive note in the FATF recommendation aid itself. And then they highlight the reasons for the vulnerability. Again, if you read the interpretive note, they, they describe how the uh, organizations could be either captured, uh, why they might be vulnerable, um, but then here they go into a bit more detail uh, to explain um, why they might be vulnerable. That's in the introduction. And then in section B, they go into the objectives and the general principles. And they say the general principle, as you would imagine, is to protect the MPOs from misuse by terrorists. And they think that this can be done by following a few principles. And these principles are, first of all, that there should be a risk-based risk approach. That is to say, governments would apply a risk-based approach to look at the um, organizations that work in high-risk areas, for example, and so on. And then they would look at the flexibility uh, in developing a national response to the terrorist financing abuse. So, again, based on the risk-based approach. And then they would look at the measures taken to promote accountability and to look at the confidence that uh, is being engendered uh, within all parties and the public as well to fund the good causes. Uh, and then they would look at the countries um, and how they aim to prevent and prosecute appropriately where uh, there are cases of terrorist financing and so on. Finally, then it goes into countries uh, should be encouraging the development of economic research. So it's encouraging further research uh, and looking into this in uh, greater detail. Section C looks at the measures. and. Um, it says that governments or countries should be identifying which subset of organizations fall within the fact of definition of an NPO at risk. This is very important. There was a lot of discussion about that uh, in the discussions with the FATF Secretariat. 
And um, just to say on that point a little bit that um, the definition of what makes an MPO uh, at risk is something left to the governments to do. So there is nothing descriptive saying. There are examples given and then there is the best practices paper that describe organizations that work internationally. There is the vulnerability of the sector which is highlighted as to why it may be vulnerable. Uh, and that's important for us to remember. And then it goes into the effective approach involving four elements in order to protect the MPOs from uh, prot potential terrorist financing abuse. One is that there should be a, a sustained outreach concerning uh, any terrorist financing issues. There should be a targeted risk-based supervision or monitoring. MPOs could be required to license and register. That's the language used in the interpretive note. Uh, thirdly, that there would be an effective investigation and information gathering. And um, finally, that there should be effective mechanisms for international cooperation and this should uh, include uh, the ability to respond to international requests for information. So they wanted to have, if you like, one government trying to talk to the other, that there is a focal point identified so that countries would know who they go to when they want to know about a matter in that country. The final point is, of course, as you would imagine, is in the interpretive note is that they wanted to see that uh, this was properly resourced and that there is adequate supervision and monitoring in the investigation by the various countries that are applying this. Now, just to highlight some areas which we need to be looking out for and how it's being implemented by the governments. First of all, that the subset of NPOs whose activities or characteristics um, are seen to be at risk of terrorist abuse is not uh, something that is very clear. It would be done by different governments differently. So we would have to be very vigilant to, in seeing how is this definition being applied by a government and how the evaluators would be looking at this interpretation, whether they would expect, uh, accept sorry, an interpretation that is reasonable or from our point of view or not. Second issue that I think we need to be aware of is that at the moment in the way it's written, it's assuming that the, there are the powers to take executive decisions uh, very quickly, which is understood, of course, in cases where there is uh, the, the risk of finances getting through to the wrong hands, but that this needs to be controlled by a transparent judicial process. This is not clear in the interpretive note. Uh, so the possibility of prolonged executive decisions which are uh, subject to non-transparent legal processes is a challenge which we would need to keep uh, in mind, especially on how it's being looked at during the evaluations. Thirdly, um, is that the issue here is there is an expectation which, in my view at least, is a little bit, I'm not quite sure how it would work when they say that laws, especially laws, not so much regulations, would be tailored to a subset of, of the vulnerable MPOs. And that seems to me a bit unrealistic when we come out and we say that we are going to design law which is just targeting a certain section of an MPO and saying this, section, this MPO is vulnerable or this type of MPO is vulnerable. However, that remains to be seen how it would be legislated um, and it is something we need to be vigilant about. The next point is that uh, the, the language used which I highlighted, which is MPOs would be required to, uh, could be required to license or to register. The wording here implies that one is the same as the other. And we all know that, of course, in parts of the world, uh, MPOs are restricted from accepting funds unless they get a license. It's not quite the same as a registration. And having multiple processes of licensing and registration can create many hurdles for MPOs to be able to operate. Uh, and this is something I think, again, we need to highlight. Again, the interpretive note kind of uh, just uh, mentioned that uh, governments could use this as a tool, but it didn't highlight in which conditions and uh, in how it would be implemented. Finally, there is a, a challenging issue here, which is again passed on um, very briefly. Again, it was subject to discussion in, the, uh, in consultations with the FATF Secretariat, and that was the issue of beneficiary identity. As you would imagine, many of our MPOs have highlighted that the, uh, for many reasons, and it would be, of course, contrary to the international humanitarian uh, principles and uh, legal norms that uh, people would be denied help on the basis of their faith or or whatever political opinions and so on. So the issue here that MPOs should um, 
harvest data and pass it on to governments is a challenging one, especially if MPOs are there to regulate governments or to look at um, abuses by those in power. Uh, now, uh, in response to that verbally, at least in the discussions that preceded the um, interpretive note coming out, they were saying they are talking here about entities, about organizations. However, that is not very clearly spelled out in the interpretive note. That it's, it's actually talking down to the level of could be possibly the individual. Finally, that the document talks about a minimum period of uh, maintaining records uh, being five years, which is reasonable. Others might say seven, but it doesn't say a maximum. Now, if I wanted to say that governments around the world uh, in some places could be not very reasonable in terms of going back in the records longer than that, and that is an issue that also may be a problem. It wouldn't be clear until, of course, it goes through a legal process in a, in a country and it's challenged. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Harun. Uh, and now we're going to move to uh, part of the process that applies at the country level. Uh, and Ben Evans, Green Acres Associates, is going to describe for us uh, what the National Risk Assessment is all about. So, um, Ben, how does it work? What is it? Yeah, thanks, Kate, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, yes, the National, the National Risk Assessment um, is is a major topic. I, I've been I've been I've been working on helping countries comply with recommendation act for a number of years, and certainly the changes that have happened over the last two or three years have been very significant. And in terms of the actual implementation of of recommendation eight, um, this aspect, which is identifying the high-risk NPOs, is, is the most significant one of all. And I think for those of you who are listening in, who may be hearing about this for the first time, this is the thing that's most likely to draw you into the process and probably the area where you need to focus your interest. But it's also worth, um, let me just pull my slide chart, hopefully you will see that. Um, there are actually a couple of things you need to look out for, and it gets a little confusing because of the terminology. The first one is People talk about national risk assessments quite a lot. And national risk assessments are very important. But the thing that we've been talking about so far has been a second risk assessment, which doesn't have a, a catchy name in the same way, but is that recommendation eight requirement specifically for the M MPO sector. It requires governments to identify the features and types of M MPOs which may be at risk. So it's identifying which of your MPOs are at risk. But there's another thing that happens, and, and another thing that you may be hearing about, and is, and is a much bigger issue in most countries, because this, this issue is not just about NPOs, it's obviously about the entire economy, and the money laundering and terrorist financing risk within the entire economy. And the first thing, the single most important thing that countries are being asked to do, is something called the national risk assessment, which is looking at the entire economy of the country, and identifying which parts of that economy are uh, risky for either money laundering or terrorist financing. And part of that process will include looking at the MPO sector. So many countries have undertaken, or are currently undertaking, or will be very soon undertaking, a national risk assessment, an NRA, where they will be trying to identify the terrorist financing risk, and they will be looking at the MPO sector as part of that. Now, because it's looking at the entire economy, um, MPOs aren't the most important thing, and it's been difficult in many countries for, for MPOs to have any kind of representation uh, in relation to national risk assessment. Sometimes governments don't consult at all. Other cases, governments have consulted but only consulted other banks or other government agencies and, and, and not extended their consultation as far as the, as the MPO sector. But if you're aware of the national risk assessment going on and you have some opportunity to get involved in that, I think it's very important because if, if MPOs can get involved in the national risk assessment and challenge the orthodoxy over whether there's uh, whether the sector is high risk in the first place, that can really help further down the line. Um, after a national risk assessment has been done, there is then this separate process, which is the identifying of those MPOs, which may be at risk of terrorist financing purposes. So regardless of whether the, the, the entire sector is seen as low, medium, or high risk, there will be an expectation that they will try to identify, particularly if it's a medium or high risk, which parts of the sector, which subcategories, are likely to be at risk of terrorist financing, as has been mentioned by the last couple of speakers. So those are the two things you're, you're, you're likely to, to, to hear about and to be looking out for and you'll want to be getting engaged with. Um, I'll go too far. 
What's the significance of this? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, the, the national risk assessment in particular will set TF, the terrorist financing agenda for the country. So whatever the results of that are will be extremely important in setting the country's uh, national strategy in relation to terrorist financing, which can have a great impact on the MPS sector. Um, the outcomes of the national risk assessment and the outcomes of the assessment of MPOs will be used to justify national policies and national actions when the country is assessed for its compliance with the FATF regulations. Something that happens through a mutual evaluation process every four or five years, a country will get assessed on how well it's applying the FATF rules and, that's, and, and the, the results of these risk assessments will feed into, into that process. Um, and interestingly, and one of, the, one of the really positive new developments is uh, with, with the new best practices paper, which is another uh, document related to, to NPOs and terrorist financing, there is actually an opportunity if you do a good risk assessment to actually s justify no further action. And I've put up a quote there from the best practices paper. It may be possible that existing measures are sufficient to address the current TF risks to the MPO sector identified in the country. The key part of that is obviously the current TF risk. If you can demonstrate through the risk assessment process that there is a low terrorist financing risk within the MPO sector, then you can justify there being no regulations. And could you tell us uh, what the implications are for uh, the risk assessment process identifying certain MPOs as being high risk? Yeah, well, let me move to the next slide. Um, if we drop down to the bottom of that, um, there are, there are there are two. I mean, we've we've been speaking so far in terms of the implications. We've been speaking so far in terms of the regulatory implications. But I think the real problem here, one of the real dangers, I, the, the the point that I make about singling out. The, the good news is is that if if through this risk assessment process, a country now has to justify the regulations that it's putting in place. So it can't say. Um, regulates everything. It has to say, we've identified there being a risk here with this particular type of MPO, uh, and therefore that's why we have these regulations in place. If they don't have that risk identified in the first place, then they cannot justify any of their regulations, and there's an opportunity. But the risk, of course, is, is that a particular subset of the, of the MPO sector is identified as high risk, and then they get singled out. Um, and so they are then bombarded by a whole range of, of, of extra regulatory uh, requirements. Um, and it's not just regulation, I think, you know, so far most of our discussion has been about the regulatory impact of this. But there's also the, the, the access to financial services, that last point there about the risking. Banks will take a cue from this. If in a particular country, say, uh, associations that operate overseas are identified as being potentially high risk, there's a very high chance that banks will look at that and will then consider uh, whether to keep those kinds of organizations as customers or not. So this is a real problem. It may be most of the sector actually benefits from this, but there is a chance that a whole heap of extra trouble is going to come to just a small part of the sector. Um, another, and there's also some problems, I think, with, with, the, with, the, with the risk assessment process itself. Um, risk, uh, Haroon kind of mentioned that you know this isn't terribly well defined in the literature, and I've, I've been uh, working in some countries to try to help them to do this process, so I've been reading through all of the literature very carefully and trying to, trying to work out what it says. There is some guidance on, on what risk is and, and how that can be identified, but there are real problems when it comes to a financing in practice. One of the problems is the fact that there just isn't the data. Terrorist financing, for, for a start, is a criminal act, so it's therefore hidden. People aren't open about it, so it's difficult to know exactly how much is going on. Um, there are, it doesn't happen very much, despite what's being said, there just isn't, you know, the, the, the number of cases there to have any kind of confidence necessarily in, 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 in the, the level of abuse or exactly what may or may not be happening. There's confidentiality issues as well. Governments sometimes claim or say that they have the information, but obviously the nature of the information is sensitive, so they're not always willing to share. So it's difficult to know what these conclusions may be based upon sometimes. And what you also get, I think, is a kind of circularity whereby, um, and this is where this, you know, this particularly toxic phrase and particularly vulnerable still has an impact even now that it's been removed. Um, there, is a, there is now a perception, a widespread perception within the governments and, and banking communities that MPOs are particularly vulnerable. So when you ask someone, 
what do you think are, do you think NPOs are particularly vulnerable, or what do you think are the vulnerable parts of the economy? NPOs are often mentioned, and the fact that they're mentioned brings up their risk level. The lack of other data means that often these conclusions are reached on the back of hunches or, or expectations or people's uh, lazy thinking in some ways rather than on hard data because the data isn't there. And so you get this kind of circularity where it becomes a truism just because it's being repeated so often that the NPO sector is at risk. And I suspect that what we'll see when, when as, as more of these processes of identifying at-risk NPOs goes on, I wouldn't be surprised to see the similar kinds of organizations popping up as being identified as being at-risk in different countries as, as each country kind of looks over the shoulder of the other to see what they come up with and thinks that, that one's probably right and we don't have any better data, so let's go with that too. So I, th I think those are some of the real risks that we're facing. But having said that, there's also... Closing in on time, so if you can get through the opportunities in the next minute or two. I will fly through the next section. Yes, th there are opportunities. First of all is this, this thing that I've already mentioned, which is the risk-based approach, which means that it's now the case that countries really need to be able to justify any regulation that they've got in place. They need to be able to point to a risk that they've identified in order to justify the regulation that applies to that. And this is happening in practice. I'm just going to show you now a case study of Norway against Ethiopia. You'll see there that Norway doesn't um, do much monitoring, doesn't have any sanctions, doesn't have any kind of compulsory re uh, registration system. Ethiopia does do all those things, but when it came to their compliance rating, Norway got a better compliance rating than Ethiopia. Ethiopia had done no risk assessment. It, it did not in any way demonstrate that the regulations it had in place were actually against an identified risk. And so therefore, it got a bad rating. Whereas Norway, which had a much looser regulatory system, had done its risk assessment, had looked at where the risk in the sector was, and therefore got a better regulation. So this is really happening in practice, and, and it's something we can, we can build on. The other thing I think is a real opportunity for consultation. There's, there's nothing explicit in FATAP saying that governments must consult with uh, civil society, but you can extract statements, as I've done in this slide here, you can extract statements from different parts of, of, of FATAP documentation. And, it's, and, and you see that it may, if you follow through, it's clear that civil society has a strong case to make the government to say that, yes, you must consult us when it comes to looking particularly at the risk level in the NPO sector. Um, and I have one more slide, if you don't mind, if I could just do that one, which is just three quick points I would say in terms of, of what actions I think can be taken next. First of all, the last couple of years the focus has been at the international level, engaging with FATAF, but now it's switching to the national level. It's about working with governments um, in, at the national level to try, to try and influence this process as it's going on. There is this opportunity, as I mentioned in my last slide, to engage with the FIU. For those of you that, that don't know, the FIU is the Financial Intelligence Unit, who is, has the chief responsibility for compliance with uh, international money laundering and terrorist financing rules. And then finally, the thing I would say, that, you know, there's been great progress, but this idea of particularly vulnerable is still out there. And I think it's really important that all of us, whenever we're engaging with anybody, challenge that old narrative and point out that it's no longer the case that the NPO sector we see as particularly vulnerable and that the vulnerability has to be proved by some kind of risk assessment process. Thank you very much. And this certainly opens a whole new field of both action and concern for NPOs. So something we need, all need to pay attention to. The other process that FATF has at the country level is the mutual evaluation uh, of how the country is complying or implementing all 40 of the FATF recommendations. Uh, Vine Skort from the European Center for Not for Profit Law, could you explain to us how the evaluation process works? Oh, we can't hear you. Thank you, Kay, for the introduction. Oh, there we go. For the introduction, I will just quickly remind ourselves what are the evaluations and how the process is going on. So basically, the evaluation is the crown of the, uh, uh, of the issues that we were talking about so far. It's a process where the FATF or the FATF-style regional bodies, uh, which are nine across the uh, different regions of the world, they assess whether the country complies with all of the different 40 recommendations. Uh, and among them the recommendation eight. And it usually takes a long time, up to one and a half year, 
and one part of this process is also the actual visit of the evaluators that come into the country, spend some time during the meetings, uh, should meet the nonprofit sector as well, and uh, finalize their report uh, by the end of this long assessment process. The reports are published, uh, they are usually uh, found online, uh, and they are called mutual evaluation reports, or you will see the MER uh, uh, short for it in our slides. And just to mention that prior to the 2014, uh, the evaluation process was very, very technical. It revolved around um, regulations more than anything else. Then after 2014, a new round, the fourth round evaluations, includes a, a different methodology that really looks at the effectiveness of all of these measures that are being implemented by the government. So it's not only the compliance check of the regulation, whether the regulation is in place and nobody cares how it's implemented, but now they're looking actually at the effectiveness of uh, all these regulations that might be implemented. And now we are actually looking for the future improvement of the evaluation process regarding non-profit uh, sector, because only the future evaluations will include the 2016 revision of the Recommendation 8. So we are still seeing currently evaluation processes and reports that are done uh, under the old recommendation eight. However, I will show you in some of the examples, and Ben already showed in the examples of Norway and Ethiopia, the new methodology that looks for effectiveness and risk-based approach. I will also show you that uh, some of the other reports are starting to include that more and more, and these are our opportunities actually to uh, uh, to get involved. So some of the key words mentioned already, but very important for the evaluation. Risk is definitely the core of the uh, evaluation, uh, and it's increasingly used in the latest uh, mutual evaluation reports. Basically, what we learned uh, from the FATF uh, is if the government did not carry out uh, the proper risk assessment uh, or does not have a proper risk-based approach towards the non-profit sector, the country would likely not be compliant with Recommendation 8. And um, here's how it plays out, not always uh, the same. For example, the latest report uh, issued for Hungary in 2016, they did not do the specific risk assessment on the non-profit sector, nor did they do the outreach to the non-profit sector. And the uh, uh, FATF uh, style body Monival concluded they should do a formal review of the entire NPO sector in order to identify precisely those uh, which are falling under the FATF definition and those which are potentially at risk. And the rating for the uh, recommendation 8 was partially compliant, which is a middle rating. You can get non-compliant, partially compliant, largely compliant and compliant. On the other hand, Honduras report, also from 2016, also did not have a risk assessment on nonprofit sector. No specific outreach uh, was done to nonprofit sector. And so the report uh, cites that in the future, the country assessment of the risk should include MPO sector into the country analysis. However, they got largely compliant uh, uh, for their recommendation eight. I have to mention this is a different FATAP style regional body. So we also discussed uh, 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 with the FATF and uh, other colleagues from uh, governments and CSOs during the London expert meeting this year that uh, some FATF style regional bodies uh, do not always apply similarly the, the, the methodology that is basically the same for everyone. Then the second key word is effectiveness and we really should start uh, using this key word as much as possible uh, within our sector and within our national level work. Effectiveness is actually key in the methodology that uh, the FATF and their regional bodies are now looking for. The evaluators, when they come to assess uh, the country's measures, really look for effective targeted approach. Uh, measures that uh, are spaced out on the entire sector uh, without the proper uh, uh, and appropriate uh, proportionate approach should not be considered compliant. Uh, Evaluators can actually challenge the country and say whether the regulation that uh, covers the entire sector is 
the good use of resources and their time. And usually countries don't have capacity to monitor and oversee the entire sector. So this is our entry point. The devaluation can be uh, uh, viewed as a chance to emphasize the existing over-regulation of the sector in a country and uh, label it as ineffective towards preventing terrorism abuse. And this is something that devaluators will look for. So the, to understand uh, why uh, uh, this labeling is very important, the FATF and the regional style bodies do not look for human rights abuses or fundamental freedom breaches. Uh, this is not their mandate. They're looking for effectiveness in the measures to counter terrorism. And this is why we should try to show and argue that a broad brush approach towards the sector is ineffective. Uh, the, the information we learned from September 2016 is that actually the countries worldwide in the fourth round of PETFL evaluation score very low on the effectiveness. Only 20% of the countries reviewed from 2014 till September 2016 assessed uh, uh, are as doing well on the effectiveness. So this is a struggle for governments as well. And here the civil society can also uh, be placed as the ones to show the willingness to uh, engage with the government in order to uh, really provide uh, useful information and uh, potential solutions that already may exist in, within the sector uh, as self-government uh, uh, regulatory mechanisms. For example, if you look at the Uganda report, they did not do the specific uh, uh, outreach nor risk assessment. But the evaluators did note that the sanctions that are prescribed in their legislation are not dissuasive, not effective, or proportionate enough, and not actually related in any way to terrorist financing. And for, for that reason and a number of other reasons, they were rated non-compliant. And finally, uh, when we look at uh, the evaluations, we can look at Tunisia report. Uh, their level of effectiveness was uh, uh, scored as very low. Uh, they did not have any specific uh, risk assessment or outreach to MPOs. However, uh, the evaluators quote that they did establish in their legislation some transparency measures to identify those responsible for administration and management of associations and so on. So they did get uh, uh, a largely compliant uh, score in the recommendation eight. Again, uh, goes to show how different uh, part of style regional bodies treat uh, the methodology and some of the issues differently. And finally, the third key issue that we were talking about and we want to see increase during the evaluation uh, process and throughout all these processes that uh, are related to counterterrorism measures is outreach. Basically, as Ben pointed out, uh, there are many documents now that show that if no outreach to the nonprofit sector was conducted, if there was no discussion with the sector about the risk and about uh, the uh, uh, measures that are already existing and how they uh, mitigate the risk, the country should not score well on the recommendation aid. And uh, we've seen that the mutual evaluation reports in 2016 and even prior to date that through that cite whether an NPO sector was actually aware of their vulnerability or risk or, or uh, finance, terrorism financing threat. Uh, for example, in the latest uh, report issued just a, a couple of months ago for Serbia, they actually cite the meeting with the non-profit organizations where non-profit organizations showed no uh, knowledge and awareness of their uh, vulnerability or, or risk. And this, was, uh, this led also to the conclusion of the evaluators that there was a need for additional, not only outreach, but additional measures. And you can see here uh, that the Serbia was rated partially compliant and uh, that they requested a, a formal review of the sector uh, and adequate awareness raising programs for the sector as well uh, to be conducted. Similar happened in Switzerland. Um, here, the, uh, uh, the, the sector itself tried to do a quick uh, self-assessment uh, uh, of the risk, and they did show that to the evaluators, and it was noted. It was also noted by the evaluators that there are some self-regulatory uh, measures uh, and uh, some outreach and training uh, done within the sector. Uh, 
uh, however, they did know that these are optional activities and initiatives and the government should actually uh, conduct their own real outreach and training uh, activities towards the sector. And again, they were rated partially compliant. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Do you have any uh, more? Just to, yeah, just to quickly mention some entry points uh, that we should look at. Uh, and we learned those from the uh, FATF uh, Secretariat at our expert meeting in London uh, earlier this year. Uh, the countries, the, the FATF and the regional style bodies of the FATF uh, organize assessed country trainings. Basically, these are uh, trainings that uh, are offered uh, to the countries prior to their evaluation process. And uh, they can um, provide some guidance and uh, recommendations uh, for the country how to prepare for the evaluation process. So uh, we said, okay, this is the opportunity to encourage countries to use such trainings and to add uh, uh, recommendation eight issues and the engagement with MPOs into those trainings. Then, uh, uh, as Haru mentioned, one of the challenges is uh, identifying subsector of the MPOs at risk. Um, we concluded there is a need to develop clear guidance for governments on how to actually identify this uh, uh, subset and then for the evaluators to later on review the effectiveness of this uh, uh, identification and measures being posed on them. Uh, because as we uh, mentioned before, those MPOs that are found at risk will carry the, the, the uh, overall burden of uh, counterterrorism measures. And then there is a global network coordination group, which includes FATF uh, secretariat, the FATF regional body secretariats, World Bank and IMF, and they uh, discuss regularly uh, over uh, calls uh, different uh, coordination and horizontal issues. Uh, they share good experience uh, and good practice on evaluation. So uh, we thought that it might be useful to develop uh, uh, some material that can be shared uh, to simplify the process of engagement of nonprofit uh, sector in the evaluation process. Uh, this might include some templates, guidance, and uh, similar. And finally, uh, one of the main points of our discussion uh, during our expert meeting was uh, production of guidance to the evaluators on how to engage with non-profit sector, uh, some kind of standardized approach, because uh, we do see in different regional style bodies uh, different approaches of evaluators towards the sector. So this might include uh, um, information on how to provide, uh, uh, how MPOs can provide information in advance towards the evaluators, uh, at what time, uh, how can the uh, MPOs then uh, submit uh, different inputs to the evaluators, again, at what time during the process, uh, some templates may be developed to streamline the process and so on. So this would be uh, for now uh, all from me and I'm happy to discuss all the questions. Thank you so much, Vanya. Um, we now will move to Suzanne Keating from Dorcas in Ireland to tell us what it's like uh, to have this evaluation going on in your country uh, and in Ireland's MPO's experience with the evaluation process. Suzanne, what was it like? Yeah, no, thanks very much, Kay. I suppose I'll start by saying, um, you know, this has been great. Um, I'm going to hold my hand up. I'm not an expert, so uh, what you guys have said has been really, really interesting. I was just a mere practitioner at the end of this um, assessment um, a couple of months ago. So I just wanted to share with you a very kind of practical experience, both in terms of how we prepared for it, what were our key messages to the evaluators, and what we kind of felt afterwards, what they were, they were possibly looking for, if that's okay. Just in terms of preparation, um, I knew nothing about FATF uh, about two months ago. I was blissfully ignorant. Um, but we were very lucky that um, I think Hannah and a couple of people on this call came to Ireland and gave us pretty much what's been presented here, the, the basic facts about what it all is, what it was all about. That was absolutely critical to our preparation. Okay. The second thing we did after that call, where we got the general kind of lowdown of it, is that we just met as an NGO sector, we got the finance managers around, and basically honed in on what we do or don't do around risk, okay? So as has been already said on this call, this is all about um, showing to, we wanted to show to the um, evaluators that we were strong on risk assessment and this is how we did it. 
The third bit of vital preparation for us was that um, I know uh, Hannah shared with us um, a list of questions, and so we really prepared that so that when we went into the interview, we actually felt we were we were pretty much well prepared, and that's why I shared with you um, the questions they then asked of us. Important to note that in terms of who was invited, um, it seems that they asked our charity regulator. So in Ireland, we've um, had a relatively new role as a charity regulator. I understand informally that they asked him um, who should be coming from the NPO sector. So it seems that as DOCUS, with a national platform, we got the nod. But I did then say to them, can I bring any of my other colleagues? It was important to note that they didn't invite anybody else except DOCUS, the national platform. So they weren't going after high-risk NGOs. We don't even know if they were identified as such. But it was up to DOCUS to, to bring whoever we wanted to bring, and they were open to that. In the end, it was just myself and two other colleagues um, from two of the biggest NGOs. Basically, we were saying they're the ones that are most at risk in this, so it was important that they were able to share their story. Okay. Um, the next thing to note is that we weren't part of the national risk assessment in any way. We never saw it. In fact, we barely had any contact with the government except to invite us to the meeting. Um, we did give feedback afterwards that in future maybe it would have been good to come and consult with us. And certainly we were saying that after the evaluation, it would be nice to have some consult uh, consultation and feedback about the process just to see how, how we got along. Okay. Um, I shared with you the questions that we were asked. Um, one thing I didn't put in there, they did ask a specific conceptual question around Ireland. Uh, we have had in the media a particular NGO going through governance issues. So, you know, they were checking in on context. They did ask questions around that particular NGO who happened to be with us, so she was able to answer very well, and essentially we're saying the issue wasn't around terrorism, it was around a governance fraud issue. Okay. Um, if I was to say the two key messages that we wanted to put across, the first was that we were saying very much that we see the threat to terrorism amongst the MPOs is very low risk. Um, and we also wanted to put across that the way we deal with it is through our accountability framework, is through our governance structures. We don't always just talk directly around terrorism. So come and ask us about all our terrorist policies and this, that, and the other. That's probably the wrong question. You need to look at our accountability frameworks. And we were then able to convince them that they are strong. We take a lot of, you know, we take this seriously, and there's a lot of kind of mitigation actions that, that we, we take on board as NGOs. We also made the point that um, we do uh, get a lot of grants from big donors, and they're the ones that put a lot of compliance issues on us. I'm kind of making the point that do we really need even more regulation when really donors are pretty strong on this um, already, particularly if you're getting funding from USAID. Okay, that was a, that was a key um, example for us. And so as the second key message that we put across is that we would like them to put much more focus on protection of NGOs, of NPOs, um, rather than regulation and compliance, okay? We, we were kind of contesting that the balance has kind of slightly gone the other way, that this is more about compliance, whereas we were then saying what we're seeing in our context is, as somebody's mentioned, this de-risking um, of NGOs, of NPOs. We were able to give the very specific example is that a couple of months back, a small uh, Palestinian activist group um, had their bank account closed by one of our main banks for no reason at all, except that they were working on Palestine and they were an activist group. Okay, So we really made the point that, look, we're very happy to be a part of this assessment and all the rest, but guys, can you now help us? How can we use this process? to stop this de-risking, or to at least have the conversation with banks, because we're feeling the real pressure on this, and the more we're forced out of you know, working through regulated banks, the higher the risk comes, and there the vicious circle comes in. So they took, took that on board. At the end of the session, just to say it was a, one of those funny things that, you know, we had seven of them all behind their computer screens, and the three of us all, you know, jolly away, just saying what we had to say. Um, you had no idea what they took on board or what they were writing or the rest, nor did they give any clues as to, um, you know, yeah, what, what, what they thought. Um, we definitely got the sense that the key thing they were going to be looking at, and if there was going to be any criticism for Ireland, it was going to be around the charity regulator um, and charity regulation. 
Okay, and the assessment was done, I think, 2006, and that was the big thing. They were saying, you know, um, Ireland, I think, was medium risk or something like that because we didn't have strong charity regulation. And I think the main thing that they were going to be looking for, certainly by, by the tone of their questions, was going to this point of, is the regulator clear in how they're defining NPOs and then identifying those of high risk? Okay, so so it, I definitely got a sense, although I don't know, but that was the thing that they were probably homing in on most. Um, and let's see what the feedback is, but it wouldn't surprise me if that that doesn't work in Ireland's favour. Okay, um, so I I think that is probably it. As I say, you know, we ended the evaluation by saying, look, this has been a really positive process, and and we've all learned and all the rest. But please involve us in the consultation, both before and after. Uh, they weren't biting on that one, so I'm not sure if we will find what the feedback is uh, when they report back in June. So that's all I wanted to share. I hope, hope that was useful, although I appreciate that it's very much more the nuts and bolts of a very, very practical experience that we've had. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, now we have time to take a few questions. Uh, for those who are listening in, you can uh, ask a question by looking uh, on your computer screen at the dashboard for the GoToWebinar service. Uh, there will be uh, on the pane of uh, questions, and if you click on that plus sign, there will be a drop-down menu, uh, and you can type in the question there. Unfortunately, we're not able to take questions from people who are uh, on the phone but not um, on the GoToWebinar program. Uh, so we'll look now to see if there are any questions. And in the meantime, I invite everyone who is uh, not a member of the Global NPO Coalition on FATF to join. Uh, if you would like to do so, you can uh, do a return email from the invitation to this webinar, and we will put you on the email list. And that way, you'll get notification of, of future uh, webinars, information, copies of information, and we hope next year to be developing some tools for use at the country level, and you receive those as well. Looking to see, do we have any questions? Kay, if you open your uh, question pane, you'll con you can see that there are two questions there. OK. Are there either conceptual or activity-related overlaps between FATF and uh, states' agendas for countering or preventing violent extremism? Any presenters like to take that on? Yeah. I can. Yeah. I Go ahead. Yeah, I can, I can take that on. Uh, this is Leah from Human Security Collective. Um, there are, of course, uh, how do you say, uh, there is a confluence. There could be a confluence between the government's policies to prevent violent extremism and the uh, implementation by a government of the FATF standards. Uh, that is not, uh, the FATF itself is not a body that is involved in the prevention of violent extremism. But of course, uh, try, the, the whole uh, purpose of the FATF is to try to cut, let's say, financial resources off uh, terrorist groups or violent extremist groups. So yes, there is a confluence, but it's not on purpose. But we can say that um, FATF, if you look at it in terms of the, their whole, you know, all the standards on trying to push back terrorism financing, it could be part of what we see now growing as a global counterterrorism measure architecture. But this national countries that interpret and implement those uh, standards and policies which are being developed at a you know more a meta level so uh, if you ask an FATF person are you you know part of this whole CVE CTM counterterrorism measures architecture probably they would say no but as a task force they can put to work and to task to support let's say really clearly counter-terrorism measures, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, groups and individuals that are blacklisted by the UN Security Council, uh, the so-called sanctions list. And if you look at some of the FATF standards, they do refer to the sanctions list when it comes to certain entities or groups that may be implicated in supporting terrorists. So it is, uh, I don't know whether this answer is sufficient, but there is confluence, but it's not a confluence which is, you know, purposefully developed behind a computer 
computers or you know within opposite. I think a follow-up question is, uh, if not, should there be? Is that something we should push for? Should push for what case? Sorry. The uh, for to push FATF uh, to have more involvement in countering or preventing violent extremism. Well, it's a hard have, question. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, you know, you know, one thing that's something also we have been discussing uh, within our coalition, right? That if the recommendation eight is uh, misinterpreted or abused by certain certain governments, or is interpreted by banks to de-risk uh, civil society organizations, non-profit organizations that are in the forefront of the uh, difficult humanitarian work, uh, the work that human rights defenders do in very difficult circumstances, if these organizations would uh, have more difficulty to access money or to transfer monies to partners, that would mean that that, that is counterproductive in pushing back terrorists and terrorist groups. So in that sense, indeed, a, uh, the current, let's say, recommendation 8 and the way it's interpreted by governments um, and it should be used, corrected, uh, how do you say, in a correct manner, so proportionately and uh, in a proportionate manner and really in tune with the risk context would mean that, you know, very important uh, civil society organizations doing hard work, work will not be de-risked or will not be put under uh, will not be over-regulated by government. So in a way, yes, um, I think that the FATF is an instrument, and particularly the evaluations of the instrument, where these issues should can be discussed by NPOs with evaluators. That you know, de-risking and NPOs not being able again to get the money they need, the support they need, would indeed add to more space for terrorist groups to operate in conflict areas, and also not in in, in non-conflict areas because. You know, we know from, for example, another evaluation that questions by the FATF evaluators to MPOs were about the risk of asylum seekers, of refugees coming into the countries that may be terrorists, and whether they have thought about, you know, regulations uh, within their own NPOs to ensure that their money within their own country would not go to, you know, terrorists that were uh, that were coming in in the countries under disguise so there is you know this this relation uh, which can be made yeah. I think we can also make an argument that uh, regulation which might uh, inhibit organizations doing work to prevent violent extremism or work on uh, reintegration or reentry or intervention programs would be ineffective potentially um, as under using the FATF language under the evaluation criteria. Are, yeah. are there any more questions? Hey, I had a question come in via email from Latana, and um, I'm not hearing back from him as to whether it was answered during the presentation. I'll unmute Latana and let him ask. Okay. Latana, you can speak. Latana, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello. Uh, would you like I to ask one? your question? Oh, he's actually... We seem to be having technical problems. We're having technical problems. Even at rest during the presentations. <laughs> Hey, Latana, you cut out. Uh, could you start your question again? Yeah. Sounds like we're continuing to have technical difficulty. Uh, we will take that question by email it to okay. the... Okay, I, I was saying that my... Okay, can you go forward with your question? <clears throat> We'll email the question to presenters, and they can answer by email, and we will okay. make that of what is hey, I have a, I have a question. It says, um, I've misplaced it. I'll find it. Oh, wait. Here it is. 
how does FATF enforce its policies in practice? And I think Vanya did go over this, but it might be nice to just go through it quickly again. Vanya? Yes, thank you. So as we mentioned, the evaluation process is the one where the FATF assesses whether the country implements all of its recommendations and standards. And the, the results of these evaluations and the reports that are published are very important for the country because uh, different uh, international organizations and uh, different investment organizations are looking at these reports and seeing whether the country complies with its uh, uh, anti-money laundering and counterterrorism uh, requirements to see whether the country's economy is uh, uh, acceptable for uh, further investments, let's say. So countries really want to score well, and this was in the past the reason why some of the countries did include blankets uh, or, or broad brush uh, regulation on non-profit sector just to have something regulated so they would score well on the recommendation aid. Uh, luckily, with uh, the emphasis on the effectiveness now and the revised recommendation aid, this is not good enough anymore. Thank you. Okay, well, we've now used up our time, so I'd like to thank everyone who called in and all of the presenters for this very valuable and comprehensive information on what is FATF, why nonprofits need to know about it, and how we can use the process, hopefully, to our advantage. So uh, we'll be posting the recording of this session online. Please feel free to repost it and share with your colleagues. Again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Thanks.